This uh, afternoon, we will have uh, three outstanding uh, mathematicians giving lectures. And uh, we will start with uh, Misha Gromov. There is no need to present uh, Misha, who is a revolutionary influence over all fields of uh, geometry and uh, further is well known. In relation to the Abel Prize, by the way, I especially recommend the beautiful interview with uh, which uh, Misha gave uh, when there was a celebration of his Abel Prize. And uh, today's uh, uh, talk, following a long tradition of uh, Misha uh, appreciating a very daring subjects, is called Meaning of Mathematics and Mathematics of Meaning. Misha? And of course, there are synonymous words, almost synonymous, which are, which are sense or ideas of a meaning. And there is a huge amount of philosophical literature about meaning. And I just, in a, in a, in a minute, give you a list of about 20 different theories. And it's certainly impossible to read all of them. And it's very difficult to decide what to make of them. And then the only, I think, uh, simple way from an outsider to, to take opinion which was expressed by everybody, by originates of all theories of meaning in philosophy. And, and they all express one common idea. And this we accept. What is the idea? Everything done by other people is wrong. Yeah? So every philosopher starts with saying all other theories are wrong, and he's right, but because he's in the minority, we believe all the theories are wrong which, in a way, is a compliment. Yeah. Because some of them are not even wrong, of course. And then the major, of course, division from kind of what we call philosophy and science, science, of course, we'll be careful, it's a little bit of a buzzword, but I still use it, is separation of culture and structure. So you may have cultural theories influenced by culture around you, or you may take kind of structural theory, trying to understand structure in a scientific way, and you need some orientation. You want some perspective, some judge from outside of you who will judge what you say. And ideally, you would have to have some, somebody extraterrestrial or even better from out of our universe, which have absolutely no background, no our culture, and still will be able to judge if something makes or doesn't make sense. As a mathematician, we think this is the best because we believe we share our mathematics with the whole multiverse. This is hard to imagine, but another kind of substitute I can imagine, which is more realistic, of course, hypothetical, is a child of, a, of, of people who lived here in France and in Spain 30, 40,000 years ago. And the reasoning I choose them first, there is every reason to believe they were intellectually much superior to us. They were really smart guys. And uh, according to their art, and by, by the way, the complexity of the life we have to endure is incomparable to us. You know, the major evolutionary change which made our civilization, it was not development of the brain, but development of the immune system, so we can live in large communities. And that makes humanity what they are. But the brain was a minor kind of issue here. And it was crucial, however, for Cro-Magnon people. They were, and even it's true also for the people like in the small tribes in Africa, still living primitive, so-called primitive life, which is by order more sophisticated than ours, and their IQ usually starting from 200. You know that, yeah. They get two twice smarter than average men here. And, but this is, and therefore, this is what I have in mind. And must be a child, preferably, because children are least influenced by culture. And certainly, the ability to absorb and develop ideas, again, as you know, declines exponentially after the age of three. Right? So, so this is, we have to have it in mind. And then, with philosophy, another point about philosophy I want to make immediately, which I don't say much, but still, because the major impact, the major kind of body of knowledge about mind come from philosophers, is what is the source of the knowledge of philosophers. So, and Cro-Magnon Child is a perfect example 
perfect representative of, of pure thought, but not, of course, culturally, because he has a culture, of course, in his community as sophisticated as ours, so as good as that. But he doesn't have this knowledge we have from accumulate from science. And therefore, if we have a theory, which is, on one hand, has a knowledge input of a Cro-Magnon child, an intellectual level of a 20th century professor, it's not good. This is just exactly the wrong combination. We want kind of opposite combination. We want to have 21st century input on science and the brain of a child. Unfortunately, a Cro-Magnon child not available around. Yeah. But other children are so bad, by the way. And then, so, but what is the source of knowledge of, of, of philosophy? If you look, this, by the way, applies not only to philosophy, but we which I've seen even more, we see mathematicians know even more, people who work on foundation of mathematics, where they take their ideas, right? For example, the principle that if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. From where does it come? Is it scientific fact? Is it falsifiable? What is that? And I think there is only one source, and the source is called gut feeling. You have gut feeling, something must be true. Right? And one of the people who started that, one of the most influential was Frege, and he wrote many books, and when he was writing some fifth books, and he was giving his axiomatic coming out, out of his deep feeling, Russell found out they were contradictory, self contradictory instantaneously. And he wrote much about that. And then later on, Gödel commented on Russell. He said, everything Russell says is just wrong. He makes a mistake on every line. Frege was even better. So, so this is again what we think about the foundation. It's not mathematical logic, but foundational part of it. Now, but about gut feeling, amazingly enough, the gut feelings, unlike philosophical theories based on them, are a real thing. And that's again not quite known fact. And there's a kind of work which I cite there. And my, the reason, I, 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 because I know that, of course, of the name of Flory, and if you've been in my lectures, you know why I bring up his name. If there is one, person whose name you have to remember, and to whom probably half of you all in your life is him. Personally, myself wouldn't be alive here, and I think most of you would be dead, even not born, if not for this man. You know, he was the major benefactor of, human, of humanity for the 20th century. Yeah, and nobody knows his name, of course. Yeah. You know, the name, God knows what I don't to repeat, people who, whose name you know. But, and uh, you know what he's done? You don't know, yeah? He was the man who introduced penicillin to the common use. It was him, not, 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 not Fleming or whoever. Yeah. There were many people involved, but he was the key figure. And he really did it tremendous amount of energy and whatever. He was a great scientist, and he done many other things. And in particular, they studied gut feelings in dogs. And they showed that dogs do have gut feelings. They react to, to stimuli, but they, they, something happens to their guts. They the cruel experiments. You open the, cut the dog open, look at his intestine, how the change of flow of, of blood flow changes depending on, in fright, for example, they scared. And that's, so the gut feeling is real. And so, and this is a little piece of knowledge, kind of, you think, must go in, it's not essential, but somehow more, slightly more essential than usually, usually in philosophy. And um, one thing which I start, which I accept from them, and one was Wittgenstein, and another was, who you know, of course, was a kind of philosopher of mathematics. And, uh, and then the, another man you probably haven't heard of was a kind of a leading linguist, English linguist of the first half, first half of the 20th century. And they make this statement in a great weight. And we just, as a mathematician, we can't understand the weight. It looks kind of obvious. Of course, it should be so. When and what next? So what comes next? Yeah, this, by the way, what about this picture? Yeah? These are ants. And what's the meaning of this picture? Now we are about meaning. What is the meaning? Yeah. And it's mathematical, you know, there is a mathematical theorem here. I mean, not very difficult, but kind of quite significant mathematical theorem, or mathematical phenomenon, I would say, be, be, behind that. OK, we, we come back to that yeah, in a second. And then it just is a list of th theories on, on meaning in, 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 in philosophy. Yes, you don't have to kind of, uh, just, just to see how many. I mean, it's, it's, Here's two pages in, in, in big script, yeah. What is that? Yeah. And then, so uh, just, just before you go on the same, but meaning is just try to separate meaningful and meaningless, right? Meaning indeed depends a little bit what you understand when you say meaning, but meaningful and meaningless looks as a better shape. And then there are good examples to look. And one point is, so look at this sentence, I try to guess their origin. 
If you, if you know, of course, you don't say it aloud, but if you're guessing. This is a, just a cartoon about color is green, ideas sleep furiously. And so how meaningful they are, how you compare meaningless or meaningfulness of these sentences. The second is, is much longer, I, I just cannot even say it, you have to read it. It's very difficult to read. Huh? Then there are the three and four. And then if I go through, I'll tell you how the origin of them. The first one, first. yeah, I think so. They're green, yeah, colorless and green, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sleep furiously. Yeah. And then there are this other one, and then there is uh, the, f the fifth one, and then to understand the meaning of this, you have to lose the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and the last one, uh, this, just read that. This is what cred of some people, yeah? And we I mean, what they were seeing, yeah? What that? So can you tell what is, what is what? Now I'll tell you. So, number one is a famous sentence by Chomsky, who wanted to make a sentence, it be grammatically correct, but completely meaningless. And what amazing, he couldn't do it. He wanted to make random words, and he failed to do that, you see? Words are strongly negatively correlated. Color is in green and sleep furiously the kind of on the opposite end. So they come when you want to kind of make random sequence changing all the time. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. It's not random. Now, the second is, is taken from a Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, yes, you cannot read this, yeah. And this is all like that, I mean, just, I'm sorry. I don't want to be insulting to philosophy, but this is uh, horror. The, the other two, I, I made myself trying to make actually random words. And what I do, did with it, just taking the second one, actually I took lists of words from the internet and put them, of course, corresponding, you know, noun for noun, verb for verb. And, 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 and this one, three, is I took a book, and just in a book, putting on the random my finger. But this, of course, different distributions, right? Because frequency of words are quite different. So it's unclear. And make really random sentences impossible. If you try to write a random sentence, it's impossible. You, it, immediately, you, you, what comes to your mind will be words are related, not uh, completely random. And this is not sufficiently random. Even when I was doing this, I wasn't doing it kind of abstractly. I was putting my finger, and I think I was already biased. My previous choice was some directing the next one. It's very hard to make. You know, the standard, standard mistake on a random choice when you have to make some experiment with mice. And uh, you have to use some drug on them. And so you have to take, you have 100 mice, you try 50 of them. You take 50 mice out of the box, and this 50 remains, if you apply a drug here, not here. What's the mistake? You have hit junk. Experiment already junk. What, what was the mistake? How you should do it? You take one mice from here, one from here, one from here, one from here. You can shoot the stupidest and the weakest mice. When you do it 50, right? So when you're making experiments statistically, there is a whole technology how not to make mistake. You have to box. If you, 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 take, you have a box of mice, you have to separate them on random. So like one here, one there. One here, one there. Not, not like that. One and one. Because you immediately introduce a bias. And so also, these words, I was do, do, making this mistake, so to speak. So they don't look sufficiently random. But we attach such sense even to random. The general thing is very, it's very difficult to write to random Yes, very, very difficult, even to random random number. So my experience with trying on Google, the numbers you write, it should be random, they're not random, they appear with much higher probability than you expect. Yes. And then the last one, also taken from the, from the same standard encyclopedia of philosophy. Of course, I, I made this in parentheses, what I added myself. But indeed, these are the examples, that Mary believes that ta 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 and this John believes ta 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 and he just wanted to show the education, the very education, well, they use tricky words, but this, uh, for me, it's just sheer nonsense, yeah. You cannot make any meaningful theory out of this junk, yeah. You need something more substantial, and, and, and this is just a level of the kind of appeal that people make, yeah. I don't want to be critical, but hard not to be, yeah. When you read this, I mean, it makes you noise. On the other hand, there were quite smart people, and one of the smartest in this, and the most interesting in my view, was Zeli uh, Harris who was a linguist, uh, okay, okay, so here it starts. 
who introduced a whole similar concept, but he stated subject meaningful. He was one of the first who pursued mathematical approach to linguistics, and he was the teacher of Chomsky, with whom they had a very bad relationship. And the, for that reason, he is not kind of, he overshadowed by Chomsky. But when you look, I mean, I found what he says much more profound than Chomsky. And this is, uh, if you read it here, it, it takes some effort to read, but there is definite meaning. And this meaning, it's, it says there is some mathematical structure in the language. And this mathematical structure is shared to meaning. And he is not, in my view, sufficiently radical. And um, because essentially what he said, that this is kind of essential part of the meaning comes from how the words are embedded into the language. But Yes, I want to argue that the only way you can kind of study, I wouldn't say the only, the only thing which exists, but the only one which can be rationally studied. And now, just to start, we need interesting, sufficiently interesting examples, which will be different from Mary and John, but something that Cromanian child has no access to. And this is not at all kind of obvious. Here is some examples. Yeah. So what's the meaning of that? And this is a kind of, for example, in particular, the second law, I start from that, because there was a lot of controversy. And still, again, in a philosophy textbook, you can find an ah, incredible thing written about the meaning of the second law, like saying it's just definition of force, yeah, that F equals MA is just definition of force. And basically, if you look at the background, you realize that people don't understand what, what the objects are. They don't know there are vectors, they only use scales, for example. And this, and for example, yeah, but there are many, many other shortcomings, and actually, the only kind of clear discussion on that, I found in some writing by Russell, yeah, who really explains it just for in simple terms, what the meaning of the, and, and the power of the, of the second law, which is non-trivial at all. For example, why separate first and the second law? Yeah. Why to first Newton formulate first law? You don't know what he did, it, but he has some intuition. And now, in 20th century, already mathematics gives you, explain what was the difference. That first law gives you a fine space, and the second law gives you the metric. You know that, yeah. And uh, this, uh, uh, and then next will be Pythagorean theorem. It's again then it's unclear. So what? Had, uh, certainly we kind of know it, but what is the meaning of that? And that is uh, not so clear even how to formulate the question. And again, of course, it depends what you know of Pythagorean theorem. More specific example when the answer can be definite is this sequence of numbers. What is the meaning of this with numbers? What about them? This here is non ambiguous answer. So, what are these numbers? And this is a meaning of which can be regarded as meaning. These numbers are differences of cubes. And this is rather rare sequence, but they are all differences of cubes. And, and that, by the way, is one of the essential difficulties in understanding the world and mathematics. We have simple sequence cubes, very simple operation, take difference. Look at the result. What the hell to do with that? How to guess, how to deduce it, how to come back. And the only recipe, you have to guess. There is nothing else you can do, you have to guess. And this, by the way, not, again, I, I made this example. It's very impossible to make example on random. Of course, this example motivated by something, you know. So, uh, of course, even if it's not constructive, general philosophy of Kolmogorov uh, information is to, uh, which is the minimal, Amount of characters to describe yeah, okay, yes, I, 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 this you can do, but it's completely pointless. It doesn't tell you anything. Even so, so come on, theory is worse. I'm sorry, this is worse. This, unlike usual probability theory, you can use. Probability, okay, this is another, yeah, well, I don't touch much of this, but this is a, So, what's come on, theory? It's just words. So, yeah, you can say it in slightly different words, but it's completely, I think, again, misjudged in its applicability. It's a zero applicability. Because appeals, you see, the power of the theory appeals to concepts of infinity. Concepts of infinity, when God, our mathematics changes drastically. It's not the same infinity. Ten to the billion is more than infinity, right? And, this, and that, for, for Kolmogorov theory, is just an illegibly small number. So, and. Uh, and, that's, and this, by the way, one also point about language, because in, in the language, in, and in, not only in the language, we always have this kind of uh, f well, uh, phenomenon. It applies not only to language, especially clear for seeing, for vision. Because in vision, we have two-dimensional screen, which is, of course, again, not quite true, but if, in very simplistic terms, our retina is two-dimensional. We project second three-dimensional. We lose third coordinate. 
And this third coordinate from where it came. So we have, we have very complicated projection from where something quite simple. And this is a, one of the basic, and, and the language, of course, this is associated, uh, the, 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 the similar thing is generative grammars. So language, language is generated by simple mechanism of substitution, but it repeated several times, and then becomes complicated. And that makes deciphering languages so, so why there is, up to today, even grammatically, you cannot correct, understand sentences, syntactically, forgetting any meaning, yeah? Because the number of potential representations of the sequence is huge, exp grows exponentially, even if you know the rule, yeah? So, but then again, it is a, uh, but uh, uh, the meaning of that, of course, it came, of course, this is a kind of a, a caricature on the Balma series in physics, yeah, you know. This is a bored interpretation of Balma series in physics. This is not a joke. This is one of the major steps in physics is bo as Bohr understand, Niels Bohr understood the meaning of the spectra, which were coming in this kind of differences. Those were inverse, inverse squares, or, or rather than uh, direct cubes, yeah. So it's just about the series turned upside down for mathematicians. So again, it's very difficult to make anything on a random in the mind, yeah? This is one of the points. And this, by the way, uh, one interesting point which will come later on. And, and then, well, what about that, yeah? That, of course, as a mathematician, we have to look at that, yeah? You know what it is? I don't know that, huh? You never think, oh. This famous formula, one of the most beautiful formulas in the world, is one of the Ramanujan mysterious formula. It's the best, one of the best way to compute pi. You know, the fastest convergence way to can compute pi. There are version of that, but this is essentially the best. And why, why these numbers? You know? How he arrived there? No, but there is, it's not. It was lost for many years, and then it discovered in the 80s, and now I think people understand where it came from, background, not me. I mean. But you can find on the internet kind of many, many things written about that and other, other formulas of that kind. And this is used by Tuchinovsky, this kind of formula actually for computing pi up to several billions of, of, of decimals. So but the meaning of that is I believe that some numbers are discriminant or some number field there or something like that, associated with um, special points on elliptic curves. Now, yes, one point about meaning, and this is a picture which illustrates it, Right or wrong, rightly or wrongly, but you cannot, it's, or it's very difficult to see or ascribe meaning when you have something homogeneous. And particularly in language. And this one of the points of the disagreement between philosophers of the language is if there is meaning within language itself or only when it inter interacts with, and then with what? With the real world? What the hell is the real world? Language something before our eyes. By the way, what is the language? And meaning associated with language, but what is the real world? Yeah. And again, yeah, I just I don't have here. There is a kind of discussion of of of, of, uh, of physics like Pauli or Einstein uh, is emphasizing the point that the real world is just a word. There is no real world in, aside from scientific point of view. We just very convenient world. We live in that, but we cannot well, incorporate it into any. Uh, any scientific theory. And then, secondly, is point is in exactly what is the role of the language? Is if we can speak about common language, not just mathematical language, but just, you see, amazingly enough, mathematically you can say where we have precise language independent on the, on the natural language. However, we are introduced to mathematics by natural language. Somehow you accept rigorous language, though we start with an rigorous one. And any interpretation of mathematics, of meaning, goes back to natural language. So there is a power in natural language incomparable to mathematical language. Mathematical language is, in a way, you cannot do without mathematics, but you shouldn't kind of idolize it. Yeah, it's just, you just say X, you use it as an X. But the hand, it is your natural language. And then, the point now, we want to change our perspective. So, because we want to proceed as mathematicians. And as mathematicians, the only way we can feel happy is if we have something universal. That, that the object must have some universality. And any outcome of the language usually associated with what we do with our culture, ta -ta -ta, which has no universality, right? Say so our language or outcome of the Cromagnon child will be somewhere different. For example, if some uh, uh, American 
believes that pre President Obama is President of the United States, Barack Obama, President of the United States, for the Cromanian child, you are absolutely parallel centers with different names, who is the chief of the tribe. It will be completely the same, but culturally will be very different. By the way, here, in this little digression, in this sentence that Mary believes, ta -ta -ta, the only interesting point, which of course completely invisible for Americans, is the use of the word belief. In French and Russian, don't say it believe, it's absurd, yeah? You believe, so, Marine Mathieu, je crois que ta 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 ta. It's absurd. The same would be in Russian. I'm an American, you use this word for that reason. For completely cultural reasons, which I don't quite understand why, but anyway, it's very American. It has nothing, nothing. But, for, but these people analyze very seriously. They analyze somebody's beliefs, yeah? Or people believe that white is white, and white paper is white or something. It's completely, it's just, but then, Another point about understanding, which is somewhat paradoxical. So first, we switch from meaning to understanding, because meaning is something you understand. If you, there is nothing to understand, there is no meaning. Understanding is understanding, meaning or ideas or sense. So we change immediately within the language. Actually, natural language is extremely helpful, right? We trust it up, up to a point, yeah? And then we have to switch to, to mathematics, of course. And Another interesting point about understanding, which is kind of paradoxical, and it is not about the real thing and what is really, but about redundancies, what is irrelevant in the language. Exactly, if you take the Kolmogorov sequence, it's completely meaningless. Perfect description is a random sequence, right? So, say, in more elementary example, which I described, there's nothing to understand telephone directories. It has highest kind of, extremely high kind of uh, entropy. Lots of information there, nothing to understand. So, but understanding redundancies is in, very interesting. So the structure of the languages and what we understand is in redundancies. The structure of redundancies. This is what the basic part of, 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 of the language. And then algorithmically, what we want to achieve in this kind of ideal purpose, which of course, we, it's not, not done yet. We want to have universal algorithm, really simple universal, mathematical, appealing to abstract entities. And when you apply it, to any kind of income as an outcome, it gives you meaning or understanding. And this meaning or understanding, you will not be able to understand what it is. This computer tells you, this is meaningful, this is unmeaningful, you don't know what it is. So the outcome immensely complicated and diverse uh, and structurally has, uh, has no real structure, like trees, leaves, like uh, leaves on a tree. But the core program is just one, it's a germ. It's simply describable, which is of course not true about biological germs, from where things grow but from where everything grows. And this you want to describe, the algorithm. And this will be a fixed point of the algorithm, which is, of course, in agreement with how theory of algorithms is made. All definitions of, of computability depends on the fixed point logic, especially clear for the Turing machines. Yeah, Turing machine, Turing programs are fixed point of simple transformations. And they are very particular transformations. But of course, they're too complicated for the real life. Yeah, this might be much simpler. The point is, it, it must, stupid algorithm must be working. Now again, some picture came. Maybe I return back to the picture because be, I, 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 then I forget. The, because there was already some picture before about this. No, no, it goes in the wrong way. How to come back? What, what, uh, what happened? I just cannot, I can, uh, I cannot come back enough. Yeah, uh, it was a um, picture about ants, yeah? So what about ants, yeah? No, where did my ants? They disappeared, huh? Was before up up. So I don't want to go up. Ah, okay, yeah. So what what about ants? You know what is what, what's mathematics behind it? It was meaning of that. So that's quite 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 simple and quite nice algorithm. That if you look apparently I didn't check it, but this is what people say. Trust them. That if you look how ants find their highway to good source of food. So there is here ant hill and there is source of food, and they find approximately shortest or fastest uh, route. How do they do that? 
What is the algorithm? And I think it's a kind of very indicative of the way how we think and how we should think. It might be something most primitive in the world, and it should work. It might be the most primitive thing, but the answer they don't think. However, they find the shortest route and pretty fast. Yeah? And so it works like that. When ants go somewhere, they leave their smell, their pheromones, and they mark their part by smell. And the other follow the smell. The stronger the smell, the stronger the smell, the more ants will follow the probability of going. Therefore, the shortest route, if there are several alternatives, will be the one visited most, therefore most preferred. And eventually, everybody comes there. So it converges. First, they go on random and many paths, and then they converge to the shortest route. And this is what algorithm I have in mind. This we need for this. You don't need this complexity, ta, 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 but something super primitive, much more primitive than what you do. And this amazingly can bring this kind of results. And this, I think, is a fantastic result. Yeah. And our brain is, not, is, is a like, collection of ants. It's how it works, but we don't know that. It was discovered rather recently. And this algorithm was not apparently known kind of formally in the, in the, in the mathematical communities we 10 years old. Well, of course, it was kind of known, but not quite. Yeah. So this is what we are after. This kind of mathematics which we want to extract, what, what kind of meaning we have in mind. Oop. Because of the, 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 the next round of pictures is about universality. So what's universal about this about these pictures? So each of them describes something very specific, yeah? This is a kind of a called memory foam. You put here and you have your imprint. And what is the second one? It's also about imprinting. It's also about imprinting, so I brought them together, and this how s small animals know their parents. This imprint, imprinting mechanism. And also universal. It has nothing to do with whether you're a chick or duck or whatever. Right? It's as universal as you have your trace on a soft, on a soft surface. Yeah. As primitive, and you know how it works. And it is um, there's the first moving object. The first moving object is a mother. So you have to know first and to move, they're universal. And then, and then your mother, whatever it is, whom you follow. And irrelevant on, and this was verified in very many instances for flying birds, for this kind of birds, yeah, how they stick to the first moving object. And this, interestingly enough, this was discovered, usually it associated with the name of Lawrence, Con Conrad Lawrence, who was writing in the middle of this century. But actually, it was 100 years, done 100 years before, in, in, in mid uh, 1860s or 1870s, by Douglas, Douglas Spalding, who was, in my view, completely a great discovery, and which uh, psychologists don't appreciate. Yeah, yeah the thing is too simple. Yeah. But this is really one of the basic instances of how psychological psychology works, yeah. and what what meaning is about. And it, this are build potential. These kind of things are building blocks of how we make meaning, and not necessarily that, but this this in examples. And if you, yeah, if you can, there are the, a few other examples. Another famous example I couldn't find a good picture on the on the, on the net is called even even better. In, 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 let me write it. It's called. Goose hog effect, yeah. It's another remarkable thing, where again this universal logic appears and it has more with learning. And how small animals distinguish flying shadow, whether it's a goose or it is a hawk, whether you stay or you run away. How do they know? Yeah. And again, there is a fantastically simple algorithm, which works, again, the most primitive one, and it works fantastic well, well enough to survive for genes. Some of them may fail, of course. Maybe 10% will be not successful, but 90 survives. And this uh, algorithm goes from the generation. And this is the following. Those shadows which you see frequently, you, don't, you ignore them, which are rare, you run away. And that's it. And this, again, the fundamental distinction between frequent and rare. And that's actually the basis for everything. Yeah? There is frequent and rare. However, probability theory is not quite adequate to properly represent it. Yeah? Because there is some psychological problem also with probability theory. See, see, the, the, you fly away when there is the, the Run away. They're chicken. They're chicken. They don't fly yet. They just run. When it's, if, 
yeah, they run a pure second time, and if you see the first, four, fourth time, they don't run away, the same shadow. Oh. And of course, the profile you see, yeah, this is the kind of the picture. This is a profile. Oh. This direction is Hawk, and this direction is Giz, yeah. This is how they distinguish. In, in information theory course, I mean, rarity is the key uh, measure of uh, what you will consider for action in the uh, shadow information yeah. theory. Well, yes and no. If you have a, um, a, a something random which never used again, you forget it, right? You don't use it. It's trickier. That's a trickier. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's kind of opposite. This is the whole point. Statistics works sometimes directly, sometimes reverse way. And that's another point, yeah. Of course, statistics is everywhere there, but it's again, it's, this is a uh, marvelous, marvelous example. And biology provides you with lots of such examples, of course. And now, uh, the point which I want to make again that, and uh, to now to come closer to, the, to what I actually may say, though I don't, cannot say too much, let me see, oh, I, I use almost all my time, is that you have no chance to understand what is the meaning or what is understanding per se. All you can do as a mathematician, because the, the, because the object which you, are, you assign meaning or understand, they're too diverse and too heterogeneous, and there is no point talking about that. You can talk, you know, just you know, about what you know, you don't know, it's, it's not even interesting. However, what you can imagine, and eventually I'm pretty certain you can do, to, to imagine universal algorithm for extracting what you call knowledge or information, or understanding or ideas from more or less any kind of flow of signals, from more or less everything. By the way, uh, uh, in the example, I think I missed some of them. But one example I didn't discuss, which is uh, also quite, two, two examples quite instructive, which I want to say to us about them. One of the meaning, of, uh, when they don't exactly in the language, but of, though look similar, but quite, quite different. One of them is how stars divided into constellations. And for, for us, we know it's kind of meaningless. However, I, I am not joking. I read a book, science fiction book in French, where it starts, the starship landed in such and such constellation. I mean, uh, so for some people, it's a real thing, yeah. And however, it's culturally, it, it's interesting that the mechanism in your brain, if it has another input from culture, it organizes everything. It gives structure to things which even don't have structure. However, it does give structure. Interesting thing when it extracts existing structure, but not a sign artificial one. And the trickier thing, and my, my far more interesting is, what is the meaning of a position of pieces of a chessboard? Again, we had chessboard, you have pieces, if you have an elementary experience with chess, we can immediately say it's meaningful position, either it's a tutor, part of the uh, uh, fragment of a party, or it's just randomly position things. What, what is the indicator? How we can do that? So what is the algorithm which is looking at, say, a few thousand positions, usually non-random, will know the next one is also non-random. And it corresponds to some, this have meaning to that. Yeah, you don't have idea of play, you don't have idea of game, but some configuration are meaningful and some meaningless. And that's a highly non-trivial issue, and this is one of the core points which you want to make. How to do, to have a universal algorithm which will do that. And universal might be also simple. It's not difficult to make an algorithm, universal algorithm, which in particular solves this problem, but the number of steps will be something like 10 to the 20. Right? It's not good. It might be short. And this is exactly where the kind of the stumble block is. It's not very, it may have kind of quasi-realistic, but not sufficiently realistic. And that's another problem. In, uh, big numbers just, when you go out of 10 to 12 or something, you must be very careful what things mean, yeah? And so this is a, uh, we have to face, and now we come to this universal learning, oops. This is. And so just what is, again, you want to describe in universal terms. You cannot say much about meaning and understanding, but about learning amazingly many things can be stated in universal terms. Universal depends not at all on what you learn. Still, there is something, of course. And one is, which is tricky, and I just don't quite know what to do with this. I think it's a fundamental problem. 
that when you have in something coming to your mind, to your head, the signals, they have some background attached to them. For example, and it's un unclear so how to, to differentiate, how to incorporate that. So let's look at just written language, yeah, so it's symbols, yeah. So, so first, what is a language? Yeah. So mathematicians sometimes, the language is just a set of sequences and find the many in some alphabet. Or being more sophisticated, they say some probability measure on this set, which is, of course, wrong in a kind of serious way. It's, it's just, well, it's just, just to say, like, you know, like to say that Hilbert's space is a set. I mean, it's, it's, it has something, yeah, it's very special, and you have to know the speciality. You cannot exactly catch it. You have to have sort of, sort of called logical envelope with what you see. But it cannot be just anything. And one of the major mistakes, for example, in this definition, right? one is the obvious one, because this doesn't depend on symbols. You change the right shape of the symbols, their names, and nothing changes to the language. So it's already, kind of, you, it's already there is something arbitrary. So what you do have in the language, and this corresponds to many other singles, imaginingly enough, you see, it's slightly more simple language to describe it, mathematical language, not of sequences of symbols, but, uh, but more universal language, namely of pseudo groups, group poets, or categories, if you wish. So the essential point of these strings, or any other strings, is that you can go from here to here, and it will be the same sequence, or almost the same. And this already adequately describes the language much better. It gives you much more economical and corresponds to what, you, to what happens, I think, in your psychologically. And there are good experiments showing that. And secondly, it suggests what to do next. However, if you look at a spatial structure, of course, it, it will be different. This, 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 this will be different. And you, on the other hand, you cannot completely take it away. And one of the examples I love to to bring up how important it is. If you want to explain, so I'm kind of a reluctant student, and you want to say, what is an order relation? Okay, I got an abstract order relation. And it says, if I have this, this implies this B is C. Okay? And I'm saying, I don't understand it. And I, I refuse to understand it because you wrote this on blackboard. I, I, I'm blind, I don't see what you write. How I know that in this blackboard, B follows A? Okay, I say, I'm saying it in this uh, temporal sequence, but I live in a different universe, I don't have time. How can you explain me this, uh, this without already having idea of the order, not idea, but structure of the order in your, in your mind, to explain that in this sign A goes before B in your language. So you know A and B, has, there is a relation, but how you know this and not this? And as you know, all mathematicians, I think, most of us make mistakes, reverting, uh, equalities all the time. In our brain, they are symmetric. You see, how you know who is who? There is no way to say it unless you have your computers, the really rigid, really, really rigid bodies, yeah, to which the same things are attached. Without them, we just cannot say it. And that's not a joke, yeah? Because the once ideas go to new systems which you want to describe, you don't know what are the background structures there. And on the other hand, it's very hard to imagine something radically different from the input. For input, of course, the basic uh, structure is temporal order. This temporal order for, e for e incoming singles, si signals. Inside of your brain, there is no reason to expect that there is synchronization of time. It's not there, right? So you have to make much softer theory, which doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't not, uh, wouldn't have this kind of order, and still you can accept it. And mathematical logic says nothing to you. I mean, just they all attached to language. You believe they are God given, but it's not. And this is a kind of the problem. You have to go next level beyond mathematical logic and use, of course, some mathematics for that. And something I can say, something I cannot. So let's go next. And so this is a, just the list of ingredients which can go there. They all kind of abstract, and they all can be done, kind of formalized, they don't want to write formulas. And then what's more interesting, there are restrictions which we know from psychology. <coughs> that we cannot accept even number five. There were some people saying magical seven, that we can't have seven objects. And this, of course, 
I, I now believe it, then I actually look carefully, and then now it's, uh, uh, I believe it's maybe three and a half, so to speak. We cannot even four objects, we cannot have four different objects have simultaneously in mind. And it's very interesting, if you look at chess, yeah, the maximum structural unit will be three and a half, something between three and four, right? The, and then you can divide it into classes, and then again, you have more elaborate things. But simple set that don't exist with more than four elements. Five is infinity. For me, of course, very convincing because in the Russian language, five is infinity. The, the syntax of Russian language is the same. Five is infinity. From five on, all numbers are infinite. Right? And they actually, which I learned, of course, from, 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 not from, in Russian, nobody knows that, yeah, because we don't make mistake. We have different plurals. Before, in less than five, more than five. And no, no Russian knows that, of course. <laughs> That's the whole point. Yeah, you, you cannot trust your, 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 your knowledge of your language. Okay, and so there are these const constraints, and so the point is that you have to, you have to kind of use them. Yeah, these constraints, of, on one hand, you can say, why to use them? On the other hand, the trouble is, you ha otherwise you have too many possibilities. So this constraint may be useful if you want to do something. And then, this is our conjecture, and this is the principle you have to, to follow. So on one hand, you want to do things in the most abstract way. So there are these signals, nature, which you don't know. You don't know even the background where they're written. So it's kind of unspecified background where you write these things, yeah. However, what you do have, of course, it's this fundamental. The thing already, there is some coordinatization of the space, yeah. So it's represented as a space of sequences or, or, or arrays of signals. And there are places where they're put. And therefore, the number of possibilities is exponentially large, the number of places. So it's essentially infinite. Right. As again, I'll be careful what the infinite means. This, by the way, another interesting point about linguistics that people say in linguistics keep repeating, keep repeating it, that you can generate potentially infinitely many sentences. Right? And this you can find in many textbooks about linguistics. However, if you think that the time humanity has, I know it's limited at most to very optimistic, in other maybe four billion years, yeah, before the sun would explode, right? It's, it's instantaneous, yeah? And how many sun is being generated every second? And then you see it will be 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20 or something, a small number. It's very far from infinity. So you cannot generate even that many, right? And so, and that's interesting point, yeah? There is no infinities here. So numbers are small, yeah? 10 to the 20 is infinity, almost, yeah? Now, of course, you um, may, may be careful, yeah, maybe 10 to the 30, yeah. Which will never reach. What is sorry, what is the that there is a simple algorithm, simple in a way like this, simple ant algorithms, which allows you to apl applicable to all dis indiscriminately to all sequence uh, arrays of signals. I say array, by the way, more or less as Paul Carey was speaking about signals entering the visual system, because you don't know the background where they organize, but still they own some geometric background, or geometric like background. And when you apply it, you extract something which corresponds in certain instances to what you call meaning or understanding. And uh, again, it's, you have to go through and see what is a simple, I gave you example of simple algorithm like ants or this chicken. This means simple. In, in these uh, cases, these were built-in algorithms, but in case of meaning decoding, yeah. it could be an algorithm which you learn. What I mean? No, no, you don't, you don't they, they happen inside, they learn, of course, they, they, no, no, this, this algorithm from which you start, right? And this algorithm, for this uh, animals, the algorithm is very simple. Choose the first, choose rare, and that's algorithm, yes. And for others, slightly more, my, more elaborate. We don't know what they are, and we, because they are not shown on the surface of your mind. For the good reason I explained it somewhere, there is a good reason why they are not shown in your mind. Otherwise, you would be dead, yeah, pretty sad. But I mean, the e exceptional person where they were on the surface of the mind, I think, was Ramanujan. His kind of brain was just depth of the mind was on the surface, and he kind of barely survived, yeah. It's, you know, it's destructive, right? If you, it's like, you know, like bomb, uh, energy station go, going out of you, you cannot survive. And there are good reasons, believe, all people have it inside. And, but they are hidden, and the only way we can decide, we describe, de 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 decipher them, to guess them, you look at the simple examples, much, much more simple, simpler than that, and what they can do. And then use mathematics, of course. They might be mathematically very simple, but still can doing something interesting. And it's not so easy to invent them. Yeah? They don't have to be sophisticated like this, P and P, whatever, they're infinitely simpler. The most primitive 
the most primitive, but our mind just misses all the time the most simple thing, the simpler thing. Because it's, though it's inside this, and then, so what are basic, basic operations which are involved? Now a little bit of more mm, closer to mathematics. Oops, so they have another five minutes. Uh, this is a big decision to make if you want to design such algorithms, and one of the points suggested by the language is the discretize. So language is a fantastic discretizer. You describe everything discreetly. And it is a, and this only this part of the reasoning you at, this, at the present moment you can hope to formalize. Right? No continuity is not there. Everything is discretized. And and then in the major making how you make units. For example, typical examples, how you make words out of flow of speech. And this is known more or less, not completely. But it's interesting, interesting point. And for, for example, like myself, learning of French is extremely difficult. Yeah, you know, French is spe special where the units, phonetic units of speech are not words, and which is not said in most textbooks, which I learned, unfortunately, too late. The phonetic units are not words in French. It's different division to units, phonetically. And if you don't know this, you try to make it in words, and you can, of course, you know, you're, you're in very poor shape. Unless you're a child, of course, yeah. And then, the basic operation, there is a operation of classification and reduction of units. And there are connections, and the connection is very tricky already. So there are two basic connections. So there are something you call units. And this from there you want to derive everything, yeah? And then there are two kinds of connections. One are various similarity relations. And there are very many of them. It's not one are similar. There are many of them of different shade and types, everything. But each similarity is units in its own right. So there are similarities between similarities. So it is, behaves a little bit like an N category. You have level after level thing repeated, but this N is always small. It's three at most, yeah. It's one relation. And the second relation is being co-functional. Two units, two words, two sentences. By the way, sentences is much harder to understand. How you divide things into sentences is very tricky. Yeah. There is no, no algorithm, by the way, language and if you, another, by the way, an interesting point, you think about these universal algorithms and the one used by linguists, in mathematical linguists, by analyzing natural languages, which use the full structure knowledge of the language. At least my rough estimate, they were the same, right? So it doesn't help you if you know the grammar or whatever. It's negligible, kind of, it's negligible. Yes, universal algorithm will take care of this in a matter of seconds, yeah. It's a tri trivial matter. There are subtle things of, a, of completely different level. And in the languages, it was, and I think it's still, at least my, my, my interaction with people in the field where I spoke about two or three years ago, I don't think has changed, is say, how you associate in this flow of speech nouns and, pro, and, and, nouns and pronouns. How you know correctly which pronoun corresponds to which noun. It's extremely difficult and it's zero efficiency. All algorithms have in an honest way, they have 50% efficiency, meaning zero. Right? So it is, you take the nearest word and that's all you know. And, and amazingly, even in the language, you don't know too well, you do it pretty well. You know, and this is a very interesting point. And this is a part of the meaning. Actually, pronounce is a, what speaks about that. And then, different aspect of, of similarity, even if you forget, even if you forget this co-functionality, is that it is a different level of this kind of interacted. And this is, again, very essential, because you may have very vague similarity. And this, if it's repeated many times for many parameters, for many coordinates, it becomes a quality. And equality means that there are many parameters which are similar. And this is a secularity and self referentiality of the language and of meaning also essential. So within pure realm of logic, where there is no self referentiality, there is no meaning. Logic and mathematics, if it's really pure, apparently has no meaning. Apparently, I mean, it's conjectural. At least this algorithm, none of this conjectural algorithm would work. Right. So the only thing, again, something has or doesn't have meaning, you imagine the algorithm, of course you have to implement it, and see if it works or it doesn't, to which kind of flows of signals it applies. And then one way to, yeah, I have to finish. So again, and then you have to imagine, so, so what you actually do, how you want to implement it, in, in my, 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 the, the idea possible, Think is to imagine a dictionary of a language which will encode the sense. So it will be organized in such a way that the sense will be there. 
And uh, observe the encyclopedic knowledge is a trivial thing. You can easily incorporate encyclopedia. And there are computer programs which implement this knowledge fantastically well. But what you, but the kind of primitive knowledge of the language, it is much harder. And so to make a, and, and, and just people try to make, without having this in mind, a dictionary is for learners. So you read this dictionary, you don't have any, only embed yourself in a certain language, and it helps you in the fastest way to understand the language. And, and it's uh, the best such dictionary is, was comp compiled by, by Hornby about uh, 50 years ago. And it's now it's hard to get it, yeah, because it was modified and became much more kind of standard, standardized. Yeah. And so it means that you kind of, it, 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 in the best point, of course, now we have hyperlinks and computers, so we can do much better. It gives you right connection between different words and sentences, exactly which is representative for the language. It gives you right reduction. Certainly, they can't incorporate the whole language, but the best way reflected. And, and now what kind of things? go there, the so mathematical structures go there, as I mentioned, one of them is you have to modify your probability theory. So one point is use statistics. But my understanding is the way it is used is completely is inappropriate for the following fundamental reason. Because up to today, all statistics in mathematics and application worked in so far as was applied to very homogeneous situations. Right? You always make basic axioms that certain probabilities are equal, and or, or, which is closely related to saying that certain events are independent. And you make these conjectures, and then you make mathematical theory, and you can apply it, which you cannot do in languages. So, yes, in principle, this Chomsky was also one of the people who was arguing, though he was not saying in those terms, that you cannot assign probability to a sentence. It's just wrong. You see, it's amazing. You can assign the probability of, of a position of, of molecules in, a, in this room. It's a hugely small number. It's 10 to the power minus 10 to the minus 30, something Oof, absolutely out of range, of beyond any physical meaning. But so you can do it, not because its number makes sense, because all these numbers are equal. And because they're equal, even if the individual numbers make no sense, equality makes sense. And probability theory, statistical mechanics works so beautifully, regardless, regardless of, of, of this meaning. It does, you cannot do it in linguistics. It doesn't work because it's not homogeneous. And then, uh, uh, but there are ways to, to, to do that. And one of them is that probability is not a number, but again, it's the outcome of probability. You, you have something you want to measure, probability of, and then this probability is not a number, but it's again structural object similar to what you started with. So it's kind of become categorical theory again, but as, as usual, of course, you cannot literally apply kind of category theory, it must be accompanied by, by some numerics. But again, yeah, I, just, I was lecturing in Paris a little bit about that. And, it's, and, and then we will stop at this point, yeah, because it's time is over, exactly. So my, my, my conclusion is that the, I, I don't have this kind of theory. If, have, if, I, if I had it, it would be absolutely kind of remarkable, because it was, you see, just my, my motivation in this and just in and similar thought was understanding why the program of artificial intelligence, which started so brilliantly with the idea of the Turing, was complete failure. It was absolutely pathetic failure. Nothing came out of this. On one hand, computers grew absolutely fantastically. Turing couldn't even dream of that. Yeah? However, even with these moderate computers, he expected in 50 years, more or less, computers will do anything we do. Nothing, absolutely zero. They do hugely compl complicated things like playing chess, which is kind of a trivial game anyway. It's a trivial combinatorial problem. And they solve this elaborate problem. And people believe, well, when you solve them, you understand how you think. Not at all. You just, you, you just, you, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Because the premises were completely wrong. Yeah. And the premises were, one of them was logic. The artificial intelligence was based on logic. And they take logic literally. It's wrong. You take mathematics literally. It's wrong. You need logic. You need mathematics. You need physics. But you have to adapt them and they have modify them radically. And I try to indicate what should be done. And uh, again, the best, in my view, orientation comes from biology. If you know how life was handling and solving this problem, it may help you a little bit. And it's not in logic and not in mathematics per se. But of course, eventual answer should be mathematical. But of course, we cannot guess it beforehand. Okay, that's. Uh, what I want to say. So, a first question. When you, you say here, uh, of course, you are here, you, have, you are 
speaking uh, very strong words against, uh, uh, in, in a way, current state of uh, artificial intelligence in some sense. Not against it, no, no. It was fantastic successful, but the Turing program, Turing completely failed. And, uh, and, uh, so. But uh, machine learning, for instance, a uh, technique of machine learning came with the idea that we uh, don't try to compute everything that is possible. Yes. We don't care exactly right. which are the criteria that the machine will use, but we let the machine find for itself around which criteria to arrange the information, so to speak. No, because, no, because, no but it's, 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 not, it's illusion, it doesn't, it's not so. We have no single single uh, program imitating the stupidest of humans, or even approximately. Any this is sim very simple algorithm I can tell you, which will immediately any program will, will stall. One of them is self-referentiality. Of course, if you ask who is president of the United States, any program a machine answer to you. But if you ask why you told me five minutes ago that, well, and then my own machine will die. Uh, and if you iterate it twice or thrice, you cannot make any program. I mean, it is fundamental, because you see, logic doesn't apply to our language. It doesn't apply to our thought. It, it is there, but it's one of the ingredients. It's a trivial ingredient. It's something much more fundamental. I describe it in other points. Let me give you another example, which I love, and which you can observe many times. So, you know, there is very simple program how to, to, to imitating that, yeah? You know that, yeah, how, how it works. You don't have, not have, don't have to know physics or anything. You just look at different positions, how long it stays, and just make move which was more successful. And in a second, he will do it. However, if you take a child and give this kind of slightly more, he will try to do that. Yes. How to make program which imitate that. Why it wants to do that? So the reason is it's, it's, it's absolutely indiscriminately for human child, not for, for, for monkey. Why? And that mechanism, much more primitive, we don't know it. And when we understand it, then we will be the next step. And that's what we are missing. It's much more primitive, invisible for us. It just indirectly appears there's a deeper working inside the brain, and, uh, which makes meaning and makes these kind of things, where they absolutely have no meaning in the, in the usual sense. But the problem with meaning, of course, and uh, yes, is that it very often meaning understood as something pragmatically useful. And this part of the mentality was programmed and installed by selective evolution. And this is uh, the, the trend which I think is perpendicular to that. You see, the whole point is evolutionary theory is beautiful when you know where it fails, not when it works. People use it all the time, oh, it's here, it's here, but it's like by using the law of large numbers. Anytime it's satisfied, they don't know, it's not interesting. Interesting when it fails, then something interesting happens. And this, in, in the history of evolution, you know, this was Wallace who was against Darwin, indicated this point. Evolution theory, selection theory fails in develop, in develop it just doesn't agree with the development of human, human intelligence because there is something in, in there and this something is of different nature. It came there for a different reason, and not in contradiction with selection, but for mechanism available, and this is mathematical. There is mathematical structure which was, uh, we arrived at because it was there, not because it was selected, right? Some people would say, it, some people think uh, right, that uh, logic in the reasoning came from the pressure to convince other people in a group. No, no, the, the logic was articulated rather recently by people like Aristotle. The whole concept of logic is very recent. Right? If you speak to a Cromanian child, the idea of logic is absurd to him. Yeah, it's very artificially made by, by philosophers. There is no logic. We, just, we are used to that because we, everybody says it. Like, like the idea of, you know, of Freudism, whatever. The people install this idea as a cultural. It's a cultural idea. Logic, of course, is then mathematics, but again, the way you, uh, one thing in logic, another in common life, which is cultural. And this we have to completely forget. Culture is a major obstacle to knowledge, yeah, to understanding, because it's attached to a particular situation, it's adaptive, and our deeper knowledge is non adaptive. I mean, saying, if, like Ramanujan was adapting to environment, he wouldn't be Ramanujan. And this, we, we, if, if you have to do something, oh, actually, the same applies to Abel, yeah. People who are adaptive, they don't survive easily, right? And this different kind of thinking. And it's perpendicular to everything we believe is true. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. You see, that's c contradiction in terms, yeah? And of course, in biology, you kind of know how it works. It's, it's the major mechanism are not selection, but because, you know, when you have genetic mutation, that ties not this, only this particular locus involved, but much bigger thing, chunk which goes with it, which has nothing to do with your, with your selection. The probability of space is very non homogeneous. When you say randomness in biology, it's absurd as randomness in, in linguistics. It's very different randomness from physics. Different worlds of randomness. Yeah. 
You can you know, use the same word and think that you wrote the same form, which is completely unjustified. And if you use this, it's, uh, uh, not surprisingly, physicists all the time don't believe evolution theory because indeed it doesn't fit any computation. You make any computation physically, you see evolution is impossible because it's just different probability. And you know it today. The same about our thinking. Look, we, uh, like, like Fermat, great theorem was proven instantaneously. It was exponentially complicated, a priori thing. It was proven instantaneously, right? Compared to, to, to what corresponding like biological development, like look at the eyes and the insects. It required quintillions of units or steps. And, and for Fermat theorem, probably a few thousand, yeah? Instantaneous, how could it be? Because it is different probabilistic world, different logic, different everything. And this we want to understand. And we have to change our perspective. I'm saying, they don't take our cultural perspective. Take perspective of a young child. Think, look in his eye, by his eyes on this world. And then you may see something. We are blinded by our culture. Yeah, absolutely. And just every way, like, like this example I brought, Mary believes into something. No American understands the absurdity of the said statement. For them, it's normally a statement, if you translate it. You know, because they're in, immersed in this culture, and we all immersed in our cultures, our human culture, and it blinds us. It's very perpendicular to true knowledge, and very different from that. And this, it's, it's, it's a, that's a problem, and mathematics helps you to go out of this, yeah, because mathematics is uncultural. Yeah? But of course, mathematics has its own trend in culture. So, <clears throat> Between discriminating, uh, discriminating between 